and third Thursday of every month, six o'clock on all my social media channels. And this week, what a timely topic. How can we support our distance learners? Uh, if you're like me, I've got two distance learners in my house, a seventh grader and a ninth grader. And I know like many parents, we have had to navigate so much during this unprecedented year of 2020. So tonight you're gonna hear from four phenomenal experts, uh, as well as my co-host who uh, is representing superintendent, uh, superintendent Kyla Johnson Trammell from Oakland Unified School District, Curtis Sawicki. You're gonna hear from him after I give my update. But we are joined tonight by the very famous Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, Wave Sal. Uh, he has really revolutionized distance learning and thank goodness that he did because we are needing your wisdom and your tools more than ever right now. Khan Academy is also one of the preferred platforms for the Oakland Unified Schools. We next are gonna hear from Lakeisha Young, Lakeisha is with Oakland Reach. She is a local grassroots hero. She's going to talk about her amazingly successful family hubs that started over the summer, but have become even more important as we have gone back to a distance learning school year. And then finally, we're going to hear from two academic experts from Oakland Unified School District, Kellis Chin and Sandra Aguilera. Sandra is the Chief Academic Officer for the District. And Kellis, I have just heard so much praise for what an amazing job you have done to really make distance learning possible for both our educators and most importantly, for our students. But before we get into our program, I'm gonna give my, uh, my update on what is going on in the city of Oakland. So if you can cue the slides for our update. Uh, big picture about COVID-19 uh, and where we are relative to other parts of the state. Uh, the governor this week came out with a different way of classifying counties. Uh, Oakland is part of Alameda County and we are still purple. And that means we have widespread COVID. Uh, you can see now how the classifications are it's a lot more simple to follow. It's based on the daily new cases and we are having more than seven new cases each day per 100,000 residents, as well as the percentage of positive tests. And again, we are in that danger zone. More than 8% of our tests are positive. Um, next slide. Uh, despite the fact that we are in that purple category, we have been allowed to start some additional activities. Uh, starting tomorrow, hair salons, barber shops, other personal services are allowed to start operating safely indoors according to guidelines. Indoor retail stores and malls are allowed to operate indoors at 25% capacity. Uh, grocery stores uh, have an increased capacity that they're allowed. And then a number of family and youth recreational activities like miniature golf, batting cages, driving ranges, and cart racing is now allowed according to safety guidelines, as well as outdoor dance classes. So you can learn more about what the specific um, uh, things are that you can do by going to AC. PhD, that stands for Alameda County Public Health Department, acphd.org. That's where you can find the latest information about the COVID cases, what our rates are, and what you can and cannot do. Next slide. We are enjoying this slight reopening and ability to bring a lot of people back to work. We will not be able to continue to do this unless you follow these safety guidelines. And if you live in, in uh, close conditions with others, you may consider wearing your mask indoors. This weekend, Labor Day weekend, we expect hot weather. Uh, we do have uh, some concerns about the air quality, but please try and limit your social gatherings, maintain that distance. And of course, you all know where you can get free 
no insurance needed, no questions asked, tests all over Oakland. For more information, you can always call 211 or go to oaklandca.gov slash testing. Next slide. Um, in, in the good news department, we uh, have allocated $5 million in CARES Act funding for renters and homeowners uh, to help people that need financial assistance during COVID that are having trouble paying rent and other bills. Uh, you can always contact Keep Oakland Housed and the COVID-19 Relief Financial Assistance. That phone number is 510-238-6182. Two. Again, 238-6182. And also, Alameda County has begun offering um, uh, money to allow people to shelter safely at home who are not entitled to unemployment benefits. You can find out more uh, when you get tested. This is again for people who test positive for COVID and need to stay home. You can find out from the testing center or again, more information at 211. It is only available for residents in highly impacted parts of Alameda County. That includes parts of West Oakland, Fruitvale, San Antonio, and East Oakland. Next slide. In other good news, we applied for funding from the state of California due to their project home key program to convert some uh, two hotels, a former college dormitory and 17 single family homes to permanent housing for the formerly homeless. Additionally, if granted this funding, the ground floor of what used to be a dormitory at California College of Arts will also be a transitional shelter for families. So keep your fingers crossed. All told, this will create 245 units of permanently affordable housing for the formerly homeless, as well as roughly 30 units of transitional housing for our families. So stay tuned. Next slide. We also began passing out those great laptops that have arrived as part of our Oakland Undivided efforts. 9,000 laptops have been distributed out of the total of 25,000 that are on their way to Oakland students. These are not loners. These are for students to keep permanently in their homes, along with about 15,000 hotspots as well. So thanks to all the generosity of Oaklanders who made Oakland Undivided possible, we are gonna keep this effort going because this is our moment to close the digital divide for good. Next slide. You know, tonight's uh, topic is all about distance learning. You can't do distance learning without a device, an internet connection, and technical support to help families learn how to use and continue to keep that technology accessed for distance learning. And so if you know a student who needs a device or a hotspot or an internet connection or technical support, please, first of all, have them contact their school site. We also need students that are interested to fill out a tech check survey. You can do that at undivided.techexchange.org. Again, put that in the chat, undivided.techexchange.org to fill out your tech check survey. You are can be eligible if you are a student in an Oakland public school that's either district run or charter run, you can get the tools to engage in distance learning. And this is for you and your family to keep. We want to close that digital divide. If you have any other questions or tech needs, you can call 510-866-2260. Please put that in the chat, 510-866-2260 to learn more about Oakland Undivided and how you can get your distance learner the tools permanently at home. We want 100% of our students to have these tools at home all the time. Next slide. 
Also, we just announced um, the reopening of our town enrichment programs through Oakland Parks and Rec. This is going to be open all fall for youth ages 5 to 12 at 19 of our rec centers across the city. Uh, programming goes from 1.30 in the afternoon till 5.30 in the evening. So learn more by contacting Parks and Rec. Next slide. We also are in the middle of restaurant week. <laughs> Don't forget, a lot of our restaurants have outdoor dining options that are open. They do delivery. Uh, they need your love and support more than ever. There's a special focus this year on black owned restaurants in Oakland, as well as vegan restaurants. So we've cut it all. It is very tasty to live here in Oakland. Learn more at restaurantweek.org. Next slide. Also this week, I declared it Transgender Pride Week in the city of Oakland. Um, please think of ways that we can celebrate and support our beloved transgender community here in Oakland. Uh, to celebrate Pride, we're doing a virtual Pride this year uh, on September 10th. Please join me for a panel on intersectionality. Uh, if you want more information or a link to that Zoom for the intersectionality panel that I am co-hosting as part of our virtual pride week please email send zoom link at gmail.com that really is the email send zoom link at gmail.com to get a link for this and other pride week events next slide all right that's it for my update i'm so excited to get to our guests Please, we want to hear your questions, your comments. You can send them to us throughout the presentations through Thought Exchange. You can do that by clicking on the link that you see in your social media feed, or you can text the number 817-506-602. You can text that number to, hold on. Stop chatting, everyone. I can't, I, can't <laughs> see the, I can't see the number I got in chat to. <laughs> ah, text that number 272855. Again, text the number 817-506-602 to 272855. And with that, I'm so excited to turn it over to our first very special guest, Sal Khan, I am so honored that you're taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk to us about what you've learned about distance learning, what makes it effective, how us as parents can support our little distance learners. I was very excited to be part of the panel that presented Sal Khan with the Visionary of the Year Award. Sal has really been someone who has revolutionized how we see learning, how we experience it, and how we are taking advantage of technology to truly transform the student experience. And I, but before, uh, before Sal gets going, I also want to give Curtis Sawicki a chance to give some quick remarks on behalf of our superintendent, Kyla Jans Johnson Trammell. Curtis, please, um, we're so excited that OUSD is a co-sponsor of tonight's town hall. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Schaff, and thank you so much for hosting the town hall tonight. Uh, distance learning is certainly the topic uh, that's top of mind for, for everybody, educators, parents, community partners, so it's very timely. We're, we're really pleased to be here with Sal and, and with Lakeisha uh to really be able to answer questions and, and provide our community you know all the information we possibly can and also just thank you i just like looking at that oakland undivided slide and so excited about what we're doing on the tech side and just you know want to thank you for being an unbelievable champion for our public schools and our students and our families uh, i just really wanted to start by really just speaking to our families we we know how challenging this is. I mean, everyone from really the mayor and the superintendent who both have students in our homeschooling while they're holding down our jobs to 
other families who are really experiencing the compounded effects of this pandemic, whether that's a loss of a job, actually dealing with a, a health complication or having someone in their family dealing with a health issue. And so really, I think everybody in Oakland from, you know, the east to the west, you know, to the bay, to the hills, that this pandemic is having a profound impact on on our lives and particularly for families um, where life was already um, challenging. And that's really what our focus is, you know, both in the, the Oakland Undivided campaign and, you know, in large part, what we're trying to do to make sure that what's easily accessible for uh, many is not always accessible to all. And uh, we really want to make sure that what we're doing is reaching all students and families within the context um, of where they are. I also just wanted to really thank the OUSD staff, you know, really everybody from our principals, our teachers, custodians, food service workers, people that work with Kellef and Sandra. There's just, it's been an all hands on deck of everybody reimagining, rethinking, working together uh, to really do a Herculean task of retooling our entire district uh, to be able to reach our students in different ways and support our families um, at even a higher level than than we um, have been. And I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about working in Oakland is just people really do come together uh, when, all the time and even more so during a crisis and when we meet each other. And it's just really a time for us to double down and know that there's no playbook for any of us uh, around the moment that we're in. We are learning. Uh, we want to listen uh, and we want to really get better every day at what we're doing. So I'm personally excited to listen to Sal and Lakeisha uh, as well, uh, so that we can continue to learn collectively about how we are going to support our students. And so really pleased to be here and let's uh, get on with our um, spectacular guest. Thanks, Curtis. Our partnership means everything to me. So without further ado, the fabulous, famous Sal Khan. Well, th thank you both. Thanks, Mayor Schaff. Uh, I usually like having lower expectations, but thank you for that very, 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 very kind intro. So, you know, uh, w one of the principles that, that I've been advocating for a lot, and this is learning from a lot of incredible teachers out there, is uh, in times of video conference uh, to, to make it as interactive as possible. So um, you let me know what y'all want from me. I'm happy to give kind of a backgrounder on, you know, where we are, how we're th viewing me at things. And I think there's either time in this or, or time later to do some interactive. Let me know. Yeah, people can send in their questions through Thought Exchange, but right now, like, we are parents going crazy at home. How can we support our distance learners? What have you learned about how distance learning happens best, how students can stay up to date? Tell us what, what you know, particularly for those of us who are parents that need this advice. Yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll start with some foundational background on Khan Academy and me and then and, and then you know address your question so first of all you know I've become something like a, of a poster child for online learning and distance education well before COVID hit uh, but I'll be the first to say that if I had to pick between an amazing teacher and an in-person experience for my own children or anyone's children versus the fanciest technology on the planet I would always pick the in-person experience and the, the amazing teacher now Ideally, we don't have to make that trade off that we can have great technology in service to great pedagogical goals in service to the human beings in the classroom, the teacher, the, the students, and then people who aren't in the classroom, the, the parents. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll make very clear is that obviously COVID has dealt us a hand, so to speak, um, and it's a suboptimal hand. I don't want to make, give anyone the, the delusion that somehow this is going to be a year that, you know, uh, the, the rainbows will, will shine and, and on all of that. Uh, this is going to be a really tough year. And, you know, I had a, I wrote a New York Times op-ed piece uh, about 10 days ago where I said, look, we can't let this, what's clearly a crisis, we can't turn this into a, a catastrophe. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I think there's some silver linings here that I'm happy to, to dig into and I'll, I'll touch on a few, but, you, you know, the stakes are very high. Uh, what we know is even before COVID, we had huge disparities in the education system. Some kids were engaged, some kids weren't. We know that even before COVID, 70% of kids who end up at community college, end up at four year, uh, well, especially community college, uh, have to take things like remedial math, which is you know sixth or seventh grade math. It's still 25% at four year colleges. So it's not like things were ideal beforehand. Uh, and then with COVID, 
uh, the engagement rate it, it's just that it's just that much more difficult right now now uh, and you know I really worry obviously to do distance learning to use Khan Academy you have to have some baseline of internet access I've seen heroic efforts on the parts of cities you know the Oakland School District has in, in conjunction with philanthropy has done some of the most heroic efforts I've seen around getting devices getting internet access but even then when we talk to districts around the country uh, there's still a lot of families that just don't have enough support uh, you know, and, and people are still trying to figure out what's going on, but these kids are, are getting disengaged. Uh, they might not have family at home, maybe they're essential workers, maybe there's only one device that the whole family is sharing. Happy to talk more about that. But before I get kind of into the advice for parents, I'll give a little bit of background on Khan Academy for those who don't know what it is. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. Uh, I don't own Khan Academy. All of y'all own as much of Khan Academy as, as I do. Um, we're, we're funded primarily with philanthropic donations. Our mission as a nonprofit is providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And there's kind of three pillars to that. One pillar is that students should be able to get world-class learning materials as early as pre-K through elementary, middle, and high school and early college for free. It's actually in 46 languages. The second pillar is, can we make that as not only as accessible as possible, but in, as engaging as possible? And this is where we've done a lot of work that learning should not be bound by time or space, that um, there should be opportunities for uh, teachers to understand where kids are, fill in gaps, and also ways for parents to do it. And then our third pillar is how do we connect that uh, to opportunity? So, you know, coming into the, the COVID world, my number one advice, and I remind this even for myself as a, as a parent, I have three kids, 11, 9, and 5. There's so much to be stressed about. There's so much to be anxious about right now that the last thing we need to be is even more stressed. And especially if you're stressed, that's going to carry on to your kids. Your feel, kids are going to feel even more stressed and that's actually going to hurt their academic learning. You know, there's two reasons why I've, I've seen parents stressed. Some parents are stressed because they feel like too little is happening. And then some parents are stressed because they feel like too much is happening and they, they're feeling overwhelmed. If you're on the too little camp, if you feel like you're not getting enough support or you're afraid that your kids might be falling behind, I remind everyone that if, as long as they're able to engage and it depends on the age group, 20 to 30 minutes a day in each of reading, writing, mathematics. Those are the core skills that we can't let atrophy. Mathematics, Khan Academy has multiple supports. We have Khan Academy Kids, it's an app. Everything I'm talking about is free, not for profit. I'm not selling anything. It's all fun philanthropically funded. And then we have uh, K through really early college, uh, you know, going all the way through algebra and calculus and statistics. Kids can work at their own time and pace, diagnose their gaps. It can be done in conjunction with classrooms and we're working with Oakland Unified, uh, but it can also be done at home uh, with, with parent supervision and obviously older kids can do it by themselves. Writing, we have some supports, uh, but there's also, it could just be journaling, it could be doing other things. And then, you know, the reading, it could be as simple as reading magazine articles, talking about it with your children, uh, you know, reading books together if they're younger. And what I just described is essentially an hour and a half commitment most of the commitments on your student on the student side, maybe a, you know half an hour, an hour on your side. So if you're in a position, and I know there's families that have a lot of constraints, but if a family is in a position to put even that hour, hour and a half, that will make a huge dif difference for your child over over this coming time period. And once you get your legs under yourself, and you're like, hey, this is kind of working. I feel good about it. Yeah, you can layer on more. And there's and I'm sure that your school can support you and you can look on the internet. There's many other resources that you can add on to that. And as you do that, make sure your kids are getting enough time outdoors, some form of socialization, you know, COVID safe play dates in the park, whatever, whatever works. If you're feeling overwhelmed because especially now when back to school, you know, I think school systems have are trying to map the entire day. Uh, onto video conference and, and, and other forums like Khan Academy. I, what, what I, my advice to parents feeling overwhelmed is if you're redlining, don't just keep taking it. If, if you feel that way, other parents are feeling that way too. Have a, an open and, and respectful conversation with your teachers. Uh, and and I, I underline respectful because I think so many people are so stressed right now. They're feeling so overwhelmed that it can very easily climb a ladder of inference and you say, teacher, stop doing it. You're making us do too much or I can't handle it. Teachers are also super overwhelmed right now. Everyone's figuring it out. So I think everyone appreciates feedback and we just have to have really good conversations on you know, what's a must have and what is optional. And I think the school system's also trying to figure out that sweet spot. So as in all things in life, if you're redlining, if you're feeling overwhelmed, communicate, 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 communicate to the teachers, communicate to other folks, don't let it stress you out. And also remind yourself, you know, I think we all have a little bit of FOMO. We think everyone else is doing everything else perfectly. 
everyone's in this boat together. We're all, we all have each other's back and no one has a perfect solution right now. So don't, don't beat up on yourself. All right, those were some great words of wisdom. Thank you as a parent, I feel much better already. And um, thank you for reminding that we all need to practice grace and patience with everyone. It is really a stressful time in all ways. Um, next, we're gonna hear, and again, get your questions ready for SalCon, send them in through Thought Exchange. We're excited to hear your questions. We really do want this to be interactive. Next, we're gonna hear from a local hero who really has revolutionized family hubs. Um, Lakeisha Young with Oakland Reach is gonna talk to us about what she learned this summer and what she's doing now and how you can be part of it too. Lakeisha. Well, first I need to be funny. I should have brought my kids in while you called me a hero because they do not treat me like a hero at home. Um, I am- I name oh, is Lakeisha. I know what that's like. <laughs> right, I'm like, I'm somebody. Um, I am the co-founder and executive director of the Oakland Reach, but similar to quite a few folks listening, the mayor, I am a mom. I'm a mom of three um, and two are in high school. My daughter is a senior, so you can imagine what it's like to be a senior um, getting ready for this moment and, and everything is remote. Um, and I also have a fifth grader. So this is not just work for me, it's personal. And obviously I have a personal story around fighting for education and my family as well. And so you know, I think what's what's really important to note, and it was great to sort of, you know, hear um, Sal's comments ahead of time, is that our organization has always been about making the powerless parent powerful. And there's no better time for that to be the case um, than right now um, in the middle of this pandemic. And it's really clear, I think I have some slides, so I'm not sure if we're doing the slideshow. Um, thank you. Thank you. And everything about this hub, um, we've heard the words crisis and catastrophe and all of that, but that's not what this is for us. Um, we see this as an opportunity to really innovate, um, to really bring forth the leadership of families and parents. Um, and so that we're not just surviving this time, but we're actually thriving. Um, and there's an opportunity for that to happen. Can we go to the next slide? Just a little quick thing about the Oakland Reach. Um, we are parent-led and parent-run. All of us um, are mamas and grandmamas, daddies and, and grandfathers who have kids in Oakland schools. So once again, and most of us were born and raised in Oakland, went through Oakland schools, and um, we, have fed, we have mamas and grandmamas that graduated and weren't able to read. So yes, we have hit a health crisis, but we were well entrenched in an um, education crisis before COVID. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation about the continuity of learning, but when COVID hit, it was very clear for us that we did not want that continuity of learning. We want something, we wanted something better. And the Oakland Reach is all about listening to our families and building the solutions. And I think what you're gonna hear me talk about in these next several minutes is resources are great, but resources without an infrastructure and not a way to really help families access them are no good. And the hub, was really designed around making resources really come to life and be accessible to families and especially families who have like, have been most negatively impacted um, by COVID. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So once again, just to sort of highlight, um, and I, like I said, Sal Khan shared this earlier, but this is what, you know, our proficiency rates around reading and ELA have looked like for black and brown students, right? Um, our big thing is like 30% is not okay, right? So less than 30% of black and brown kids before COVID, we're not reading on grade level, right? 30% of Oakland school districts have been lowest performing schools in California, right? And then when COVID hit in the spring, only about 30% of kids were actually getting access. So just to kind of frame this for folks, this is what a lot of our families and our communities were experiencing prior to, prior to COVID and then COVID hits and families are being, com they're completely disconnected from the educational experience, right? Um, and so we're gonna talk more about, I'm gonna talk more about what we did to help, you know, create a bright spot in the midst of that. Can we go to the next slide? 
So as we all know, right, like distance learning is here to stay. Um, this is a part of our reality and it's really important that we make sure that parents are really, really given the tools to be the leaders um, of their children's education. And we have just an, an, an amazing opportunity to really do that um, for our families. Next slide. So just to give you guys a quick background. So when COVID hit, and um, I'll never forget the first day of the last day of in-person school was March 16th. And we really started listening to our families to try to understand what they were ha what was happening and what they were experiencing. And our families were really anxious and concerned about learning loss. For many of our families, this will be the first child. These children are the first children to go that, that are heading to college, right? Our families are looking to disrupt intergenerational poverty. So any sort of disconnect from learning is really, really stressful for our families. On the other end, I will have to say that immediately when COVID hit, we were getting a lot of emails and a lot of information about resources, right? Khan Academy was one. Khan Academy has been a great resource over the years, right? Anti-racist curriculum, just a bunch of different resources. What we also saw though, was there was a disconnect between the giver and the receiver, right? And what I mean by that is, we have we had families at home who had like immediately lost their jobs, can't pay bills, don't have groceries in the refrigerator, don't have the internet, um, don't have the computers or the internet access. So the last thing they're thinking about is how they're going to get on an online learning academy. What they're trying to think about is how they're going to feed their families. So after we really stepped in in that way, which was our Reach Relief Fund, we really then took what we heard from our families to think about what infrastructure could we put together that would make that would be a one-stop shop that integrated both the academic learning needs and aspirations with of our families along with the socioeconomic ones this has always been a necessary move um, for the families most impacted but even now it's even more important that we think about the socioeconomic impacts that this crisis has had on our families who care immensely about making sure their kids are educated okay and so one of the things that our virtual hub phase one, which was a summer program, it provided three critical resources, which we'll talk about. So one of them is a family liaison. The family liaison is literally a critical partner and support to families. Every family in the hub and our hub served over 200 kids. We hired 14 teachers and this all happened over summer, right? And the Family liaison's goal is to really make sure that the families are receiving the social, academic, and technical support that they need. Because like Sal said earlier, we're all feeling stressed out. This is all a steep curve. And for our families, that curve can just feel like a little bit more steep than, than for some, some for other families. And that family liaison is doing everything from helping the parents set up an email all the way to making to say like you got this don't give up right but that having that partner and someone to have your back and help you navigate it is really really critical i think for all families but especially critical for our families we also through our hub we offered academic and enrichment programs you know our kids know that they're in the middle of a crisis but they're still kids and when we think about the hub I wake up in the morning and I'm like, there's a doctor, a lawyer, there are teachers in this hub, right? Going through a crisis, these, these, these young babies. So how do we make sure the hub still builds them as, as whole children? And so our children spent five days a week, a few hours a day getting academic instruction. And then they spent the afternoons in enrichments and they were able to do, um, participate in martial arts, creative writing, as well as like urban farming, which was a combination of cooking and science. And all of these organizations were, you know, minority owned businesses across Oakland. And then finally, we had something called the Family Sustainability Center. And that is really key around providing families with the socioeconomic um, and academic resources and workshops so that our families really built that muscle. And again, that they're not just surviving this pandemic, but they are thriving, right? So those are sort of the core components of how the hub was set up in the summer. Um, I. Can we go to the next slide? I get really passionate about this stuff, as you can imagine. So I just shared a little bit, I've already shared a little bit about how the hub was set up. Um, we serve K through eight students. We had over 200 um, students across Oakland's district and charter schools. And we hired 14 teachers that were both district and charter teachers. Most of our families come from West Oakland, 
or Fruitvale and, um, and DP Stoker. Can we go to the next slide? The other thing we needed to make sure during that time was that our families had the technology they needed, right? So partly through our um, relationship with Tech Exchange and partly through individual, individual and philanthropic um, fundraising, we were able to get students laptops and Chromebooks as well as hotspots for any family that did not have internet access. So it was really important that we made sure that all families could participate in the hub and that we were able to sort of bridge that digital divide um, for the summer. And families were able to keep all their Chromebooks as well as keep their hotspots. Um, can we go to the next slide? Again, I, I shared a lot of this um, in the earlier slide, but the last component that I will share that was really unique about the hub and is really unique about the hub because we actually, like I said, listen to our families and build the solutions to support them is that each family received a stipend. So every family who successfully completed the hub received um, anywhere between a $250 and $500 stipend. Um, could we move over to the next slide? And, oh, before you do that, you saw those two cute girls cooking. That was the um, enrichment class with the um, Camp Actinon Verba um, based here in Oakland. So that was what our, our kids were doing this summer. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and you know, again, this hub was really a labor of love. You know, as a grassroots organization, we are really close to our families and we build, we believe that we can build the solutions that best meet the need, meet the needs of our community. And so I think like as a result of this and how quickly we moved to set this up, you know, we obviously got a lot of um, national and international media, especially as pandemic pods and, and that conversation came up at the start of the school year. But it's actually been amazing because those connections are really going to help fuel phase two as we continue to support our families. We also have a lot of um, cities across the country reaching out to understand this is not just an Oakland issue. This is an issue hitting most urban cities um, across the country. Can we go to the next slide? And then we can go to the next slide. <laughs> you can go to the, I know it's like, a, you can go to the next slide. And so I want to talk a little bit about the impact of pulling, you know, really building and designing this hub for our community and our families participating in this hub. So again, 90% of the hub students or black or Latino, um, and 92% of our families qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, the attendance at the hub for our K-2 students was 83% during the summer. And that is a really big deal. And, and again, a key component of that is really the role of the family liaison, the ability to really partner and support with families during this time. Um, and you can see how that really contributes. And our families just commitment to showing up. I think the key thing that's really important is that we are in the middle of a crisis, but the hope, fire, and urgency in our families has not died. If anything, it has been more fueled. So it's really important for us as educators and folks really responsible to push this forward to remember that this does not need to be treated as a crisis for our families who are looking to, to have that child or those children attend college. Let's go to the next um, slide. Um, I think a little bit more of an academic impact that we had, um, especially with our K through two students um, in those five weeks is that those students grew about two SIP, um, SIP reading levels, right? And a lot of these students were supported by OUSD teachers, right? But this is what it means when you allow parents to take the lead and really build the infrastructure that is needed for our communities, right? And obviously nine out of 10 parents has said that the hub has had a positive impact on their lives and their children's education. So when the summer ended, as you can imagine, a lot of our families were like, what's next? Can we go to the next slide? So we are now, you know, like four weeks into the school year. It's been a really challenging first four weeks. You know, like I said, I'm a mom of an OUSD senior and the first couple of weeks we have 50 minutes of, of, of instruction. Um, for those two weeks and she's trying to go to college. And so that's really challenging. And it's not just challenging for me personally, it's challenging for many, many of our families. So 
over 50% of our families are really concerned about learning loss and they're really concerned about the amount of quality instruction that their children are receiving during the day. So, so much of phase two for us is about how do we ensure the most high quality 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. instructional day for our families, right? And 96% of our families say they really want to continue this fall in the hub and they continue want, they want to continue to receive the supports that they've received that they've received in the hub. Let's go to the next slide. There's been a lot of conversation about what a win is for families. Okay, we've heard the teachers union, we've heard OUSD talk about what's a win. And what we're saying as families is that we'll tell you what the win is, right? Um, families have not necessarily, we have not, I can't use the word necessarily, families have not been at the bargaining table, right? So our voices around what's a win for our students have not been included. And so it is our time to let you guys know and let Oakland know, like what really is a win? And so I think like early on what we're hearing from families about what they want to see in terms of like their 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. instructional day is our black and brown families want to see more curriculum. And this is in the middle of a crisis and a pandemic, right? They want to see more curriculum that, sh that reflects them, right? That reflects their history and that reflects their story. 90% um, of our families want one-on-one -on -one tutoring small group instruction, mostly focused on literacy and math. Can we go to the next slide? And 99% of our families want a family liaison. As you can see, we have our amazing Hakeem, born and raised in Oakland, okay? Four children um, that have gone through Oakland schools and he's a family liaison and he's navigating this for himself as well as for so many Oakland families. And so the family liaison role is really all about helping families access, assess, and advocate, which is gonna be super critical um, to ensure a quality 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. instructional day. And I'm just sort of letting that sit there for a second so folks can kind of take it in. Can we go to the next slide? So ultimately, I'm, we're wrapping up with, we are super excited to launch phase two this, this fall. We're excited about the, the way we're approaching it. We're actually excited about our conversations and partnership with OUSD. Um, we are we have enjoyed being at the table with leaders like Sandra and Curtis and Wes um, to talk about literacy and to really push this forward. And this scenario is no different for us. So we're really excited about moving and pushing forward, but it's gotta be student-centered and it's gotta be family-centered. And so I think I wrap up by saying like, for anyone who is watching this webinar, and if you are feeling like you need the infrastructure and support to really, really thrive, you can email us, or you can also apply to become a family liaison to support other families um, during this time. And as always, sort of, you know, reach for more and join the conversation. Maybe you came at the right time. I think I almost, I, I made it on time. Thank you, you are perfect. You are perfect. Lakeisha, if people don't have kids, but they want to volunteer to help um, other families navigate this time, do you have opportunities for volunteers to help and get involved? Yeah, we have had so many. I'm glad you asked that question. We've had, we've had so many people reach out who do not have children, right? And who are retired teachers or principals. So yes, shoot us an email at hub at oaklandreach.org. Um, I will just add this, Libby. The outpouring of community support and folks really stepping up to help has been something that I've just never seen. So I just, I wanna encourage people to recognize that like, we do not have to turn this crisis into more of a crisis. We have an opportunity to do some really special things for families who really deserve it and students during this time. I couldn't agree with you more. I have seen so much generosity um, during this crisis. Uh, we did something called the Great Oakland Check-In 900 volunteers showed up to call seniors, families to see if they needed food, needed uh, any sort of help. It, it's just a very beautiful outpouring of love and connection right now when people really need it. But yeah, parents, 
parents really need it. It is a very stressful time for our parents. Um, thank you. Uh, I see that, that we are inviting your questions, your comments through Thought Exchange. Please send them in now. We want to get right to the questions right after our final presentation. We are now going to hear from Oakland Unified School District academic leaders. Uh, Kellis Chin has really been leading the charge in getting distance learning up and running. And then, of course, Sandra Aguilera is the chief academic officer for Oakland Unified. Thank you. You educators are our complete heroes. Uh, we know that you are really having to just stretch your creativity in this moment. Thank you for taking care of our babies. Cannot wait to hear what you have to say, particularly since you've got a few of us OUSD parents on the line right now. Sandra, Kellen, it's Thank all you. yours. Thank you, Mary Chef. It's really great um, to uh, share this platform with you to share out all of our planning thus far. I also want to just take an opportunity to thank the panelists for um, adding such richness to the conversation and seeing all the passion that we have for serving our students of Oakland. Um, can the slides be uh, posted, please? Um, also, just uh, really wanting to thank uh, the people uh, in the audience uh, for your flexibility, our families. Uh, for your flexibility and grace. Uh, you have extended our district and our schools as we've opened the school year. Uh, we listen to your feedback and we're making adjustments. So please continue to let us know how we are doing. Next slide, please. We wanted to start with our distance learning goals. Uh, as a reminder uh, to our previous communications and forums, we've had a COVID-19 action team uh, this summer devise our district plan. Uh, the team was composed of stakeholders. So our staff, teachers, principals, custodians, uh, clerical staff, uh, central office staff, uh, some uh, families, some parents, and uh, students provided us feedback on our planning. Uh, the academic subgroup uh, wanted to ensure that their work was led by these three goals. Uh, build relationships and feel connected, learn grade level content, receive small group instruction and feedback. Next slide, please. We kicked off um, the school year with our Oakland um, OUSD Strong Start Plan. Uh, the academic subgroup um, also devised themes for each week and coined this plan um, as to how we really wanted to start off the school year as a strong start. So you can see week one, welcoming students and families and building capacity. So we do have a lot of stress around the learning loss for our students, but we knew we couldn't just come in with a full uh, curriculum. We needed to make sure that we did a balance of both instruction and um, attending to the emotional needs and supports that our students um, you know, could have uh, you know, needed throughout the summer. Um, so, so we really did focus on that for week one. Uh, for week two is really around building partnerships with students and families. Uh, we've implemented in many of our schools, the home visit, of course it couldn't be in person, but it was a virtual home visit, more of a one-to-one -one connection between um, our teachers and staff and the families. Uh, for week three, uh, we really did focus on assessing student needs and then you know, with that information targeting uh, the support to specific groups. Uh, so we did implement virtual assessments to see uh, how our students are doing in um, literacy and in math. And week four, which is um, this week that we're just coming out of, um, we uh, really wanted to focus on deepening the instructional program and then looking forward. Uh, we've been uh, providing these themes and these plans for our teachers and we plan to continue beyond uh, week four, but the, the team that was composed during the summer really focused on how to really start strong. Next slide, please. So um, our distance learning program is composed of uh, two main factors, live instruction, uh, where um, you know teachers have whole class convenings um, and also in small groups. Uh, it, it isn't meant to be time completely and all the time during during the live instruction uh, to be during to be uh, in a whole group setting. 
Uh, it really is meant to be a combination of both. And then independent learning. A lot of times it's called asynchronous learning or learning that's happening more independent through assignments that are connected to the live instruction that has happened um, earlier in the day. And then also the use of our ed tech um, platforms. Um, so our adaptive technology programs. Next slide, please. So um, we often received questions on this topic here. It's a very hot topic in the beginning of, the, of our school year. Um, and what we are doing is just breaking down grade level by grade level the minutes uh, that we are providing instruction. This is also part of state legislation and that's why it's been so popular and it was a major um, negotiating item um, between ourselves and, and our uh, labor partners. Uh, so what you're seeing in the yellow column is just the overall minutes that our students um, should be receiving every day. And that is through a combination of both live instruction and um, independent time or asynchronous time. Uh, so for each of the grade levels, it is different. It is meant to be a little bit more time as you get into the upper grades uh, beyond fourth and um, fifth grade and of course into six through 12 um, to allow time for those content areas to be um, explored and, and gone into. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of frame what we have in terms of um, expectations ongoing, um, our families should expect that they know the weekly academic goals uh, and that they are consistent to the grade level scope and sequence a weekly schedule that provides the minimum instructional minutes by grade level, that there are opportunities for their uh, child to learn in both a whole group setting, so there's that peer-to-peer -peer action uh, that they're um, making sure to engage, and then also in a smaller setting, uh, both to give students opportunity uh, in a smaller set setting with their teacher and with peers, because uh, it is really hard uh, to maintain those relationships through a uh, virtual through a virtual setting unless we're, we're really intentional about that. Um, families should also expect office hours for students um, and themselves uh, at least weekly to get support and clarification around any questions that they have. And of course they can uh, email, text, and use other virtual platforms uh, to contact their teacher and their school site. Um, and lastly, you know, we are very focused on the, uh, the academic program, but we also need to see that enrichment and our after-school providers are definitely a part of that academic program. Uh, we wanna make sure that students are having access to the fun activities that they um, have, you know, experienced through, throughout their schooling. Um, and we do have our after-school providers that are still providing services and there's enrichment that's happening. They're allowed now to offer more services during the day uh, to help with some of those uh, independent minutes to possibly uh, provide more interaction time uh, through an after-school provider. And so that is um, definitely school by school, but that there are opportunities to do that. And um, next slide, please. Lastly, um, what I wanted to just really um, you know, show and demonstrate that we have a teacher central website that is uh, meant to provide uh, teachers the tools with instruction. There is so much that our teachers are learning and needing to really adapt and like completely change the way that they are um, teaching our students. And so we are trying at a district level to, to provide um, so many tools for them, but also make it comprehensible um, so I just wanted to give the audience a glimpse um, to the professional development development that's being offered, uh, the different sessions that our teachers can experience, um, you know, and enhance their own capacity. I know Zoom was uh, really new this time last year. I probably used it maybe once or twice, and then now it's like a, we're on it all the time. Uh, so um, really an opportunity for our teachers to um, you know, get some uh, capacity development on how they're using these platforms. Uh, and then at the very top, you can see by each of the each levels, uh, we are providing uh, guidance for our teachers. There are day-to-day -day lesson plans. Uh, and you know, we're trying to make the, um, our lessons interesting 
um, and you know trying to adapt through the virtual setting. So you know we continue to receive feedback from our families about you know how to make our uh, lessons more interesting. Um, and at this moment, I'd love to introduce Kelly Chen. He is our uh, I'll call him our EdTech guru. Uh, he has become like a, a great resource in our district and just a person that everybody is calling uh, to get help with how to use these EdTech platforms. So he's here this evening to help us uh, learn more about our platforms that we're using. Thank you, Sandra. I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure to be here and um, to be um, with all of the, the speakers here. If we can go to, thank you for going to the next slide. Um, so you saw Teacher Central that um, Sandra mentioned before. So uh, we had the idea that maybe families actually need a website for themselves. So this was something that we launched in the spring and we've continued to work on. Um, as, as a parent of, of two OUSD students, um, I realize how hard this is. And sometimes it's, it's hard to know where do I go? Where do I find the resources I need? What if my Chromebook is not working right? What if I can't get on the internet? What am I supposed to be doing all day? Um, what if my Wi-Fi is not working or just maybe more holistic things? Like I need help right now. We, we, need, we need to know where to get food or we need medical assistance or legal assistance. We designed this website that is for OUSD families. And if our, maybe if our technical uh, staff could put the URL in the chat there, that would be helpful, but it's a family central dot ousd dot org and um, it is available you can see just on the slide there that you can click down below and um, it, it will translate to different languages automatically um, and it's a really good resource that that has a, a lot of information there are videos about like how to connect to chromebooks there are phone numbers if you need help uh, so uh, just in general, we're, we're working on it all the time, but uh, definitely check that out because there are a lot of great resources there. Next slide, please. And then uh, this is a slide just about some of the priority platforms, the core uh, programs and apps that we're, that we're supporting um, at OUSD. Um, we, also, we obviously, we've got the, the G Suite for education, which includes Google Classroom, Google Docs, Google Slides, that's something that's that's really for everyone. Um, Khan Academy, of course, is uh, is the brainchild of, of Sal, who spoke before. Um, an awesome learning platform for math and science and expanding to other subjects right now. ST Math is an amazing uh, platform that's game-based, it's fun, um, and it's for math instruction. That's for our elementary students. And Zoom, of course, is, um, that's available for everyone and we're, um, we're learning more as we go on about how to use Zoom. That was something that Sandra alluded to before. Um, last year, a lot of us barely used it, and now it's really, it's kind of our bread and butter, um, but it's available for everyone and we're continuing to support that. Newzella is, is an excellent um, resource for, it's basically news articles that are differentiated for different reading levels. We use that to support ELA instruction and social studies. And iReady, uh, we're using for ELA assessment and instruction for elementary. FOSS Web is for online science instruction and Seesaw is a great platform that we're providing for our TK through second grade students, um, which is really a fantastic kind of um, learning management system. That's also a learning journal that uh, uses multimedia for online classwork. So if we could go ahead and just pause those slides for a moment. I just want to just um, just provide just a little bit of context just in general. We know how hard this is. Um, we've got a lot of parents that work in central office, a lot of our teachers, our parents also. We're trying to take care of children while we're working at the same time. It's really difficult and we really appreciate what all of, of you as, as parents and guardians and families are going through. It's really difficult. And our son, is uh, he entered kindergarten he entered kindergarten this year and we were so excited as when he was three years old, four years old, looking forward to the first day of school when he would get to meet all of his classmates and meet his teacher. And there's so much disappointment about that, frankly, um, and, and pain really, just that he's not able to, to have that experience, that rite of passage that, 
that a lot of that most kids they they get to have. Um, so we know how hard this is, um, and it's it's not the same. He's on Zoom meetings and he's making the best of it. He's trying. His his teacher is doing an amazing job, but it's it's really difficult. But um, one of the things that we were, have really been thinking about is that we would have loved to have all of our planning and our systems perfectly laid out on the first day of school. We really wanted that. But the reality is that we're building this plane at the same time that we're flying it. So if you're a parent or a guardian of a child who's doing distance learning right now and you're feeling frustrated, that it doesn't feel right, that it's not the same thing, just know that number one, you're not alone. And number two, we're not finished. The plane right now it's flying, but we're not done building it. And so we're working on it every day and we're, we're ramping up, we're, um, we're trying to grow and improve. And you can play a part. You can let your teacher or your school staff know what's working, give some positive reinforcement or provide constructive suggestions or, or you can ask your school how you might be able to volunteer or help. Um, and especially want to just give a big shout out to teachers who are on the front line right now who are learning and making sure that our, our children are learning. Um, just recognizing how hard it is for them. We have some amazing teachers. Um, our teachers are so skilled and they've basically had to start over again and learn a whole new set of skills. And they are learning right now and they're trying so hard. And I see my child's kindergarten teacher, Maestra Mara, who is, she is making this work. And believe me, I know that it pains her that she can't be in the classroom with the children, but you would never know it from seeing her because she brings so much joy every day to to the, the Zoom meeting that she does with the, with all of the students. And all of our teachers are trying really hard and, and working to do this. So just a big shout out to them. So thank you. Great, thank you, Kelleth. And thank you for that beautiful tribute to our amazing teachers that are doing so much. And uh, I, I love what uh, Joe Biden said recently, let's not just praise our essential workers, let's pay them. So uh, we have some <laughs> opportunities to address some of those issues uh, this election. Um, this is the part where we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your questions. We wanna hear your comments. So please um, put up the Thought Exchange uh, link one more time. While we wait for the Thought Exchange questions to come in, I'm gonna make a shameless pitch for our next town hall, which will be uh, two weeks from today on I believe that's September 17th, two weeks from today. And we are gonna be honored with California's Secretary of State. Alex Padilla. Uh, if you uh, are like me, maybe you got uh, this this uh, notice in the mail today advising you about new vote by mail uh, opportunities. Uh, there are going to be things that are going to be different about this year's election, particularly because of COVID. So the Secretary uh, of State himself will be here to explain what you can expect on election day. We're also going to take this opportunity to hear from folks that are working to ensure full access uh, to fight against voter suppression, which is something that has plagued our country for so long and uh, many people are rightly concerned about, as well to, as to tell you some good resources where you can get unbiased, trustworthy information about what is on your ballot this fall. So again, uh, our next town hall two weeks from today featuring Secretary of State Alex Padilla and a really robust discussion about how to make your vote count and what to expect this election day. Uh, while we wait for thought exchange to come in, um, Sal Khan, can I ask you a quick question? Um, I know that you have worked with distance learners of different ages. Uh, for those of us who have kids of different ages, what are some things that we should be aware of, of what kids of different ages need, particularly those of us who have several of them? And also as parents, are there certain things that you've seen that really encourage kids to start engaging with online tools? I know a young man who spent his summer teaching himself an entire year of geometry on your platform. That was his fun summer vacation because you made it fun. So what are some things that you've learned and what tips do you have, particularly for parents with kids of different ages? Sal? 
Yeah. So, you know, I'll start maybe at the last part. And you know, I would have given this gift to even pre-COVID, but maybe it's even more important, obviously, now is that it's all about forming a habit, you know, on something like Khan Academy, you know, there are those kids and I get letters from them all the time that just get on it and the points, the badges, and just the fact that they can kind of go at their own time, they're off to the races. And, you know, a lot of times it's not your stereotypical kids that are already, you know, doing really well in school. Sometimes it's kids that were actually a little bit behind, but just giving them a path, giving them some agency and some of those game mechanics around points and badges don't hurt. They're off to the races. We see that a lot. Uh, but for, for, I would say most kids, it's all about regular engagement. Uh, and so whether it's a, a teacher working with uh, their students or especially a parent, if you really want to help drive this, it's about just setting reasonable daily. I do this with my own kids uh, where, you know, let's do 15 to 20 minutes a day. Uh, for younger kids, uh, use Khan Academy kids. I'll talk a little bit about what that is. But, you know, Khan Academy kids, 15 to 20 minutes. If we're talking about ages four, five, six, seven years old in some cases, Ideally, uh, sit next to them while they work through it, talk about it. It makes it a, a human connection. But all of us know, especially right now, uh, sometimes us parents need a break. And sometimes we do put our kids in front of a phone or a tablet for small amounts of time. Uh, but this is a highly constructive use of it. So Khan Academy Kids, it's reading, writing, social, emotional learning. It's all free. It's funded by philanthropy. Uh, I encourage folks to check that out. And they have teacher tools, too, for the teachers listening on, on ways to assign it. Um, in terms of, you know, so that's on the Khan Academy kids, on the regular Khan Academy, same notion. Math, we have folks covered from K all the way, and actually K math, you shoot Khan Academy kids, but elementary, middle, high school, and even early college. Um, I would say older students, maybe two or three sessions of 20 minutes a day, they'd be really doing well, even if they're able to do only 20 minutes a day. Uh, it's going to make a huge difference. We have a lot of efficacy studies to that effect. As I said earlier, try to get some reading in there. Try to make it a conversation at home try to get some writing in there. Uh, we also have SAT practice that has reading, writing, and um, math in it. And I know, you know, things like SAT, <laughs> there's all this controversy and all of that. But what I point out, this SAT practice that we've partnered with the College Board to create, it's intentionally not about gaming a test. It's actually about becoming more college ready. And so if you have high schoolers of any, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th, or 12th graders, I actually think 20 or 30 minutes a day of our SAT practice in all three domains is really, really valuable because it's the exact skills that they need to make sure don't atrophy. If they do end up taking the SAT or the ACT, it's going to be directly applicable, but even more important, it's going to prepare them for college and make sure they don't have any major gaps. Uh, so also highly recommend that. And you know, th th there's, there's many other resources, but it's all about creating that habit, doing it regularly as much as possible. If a parent can sit down for that 20, 30 minutes a day, it can make a huge difference. And I will also tell parents, sometimes there's a fear of especially math, but of other subjects. And Khan Academy is there for you as well. Uh, you don't have to feel embarrassed. I can't tell you how many parents, some parents with PhDs who will openly tell me I had to review my algebra. I you know, I didn't know how they teach adding fractions in the common core, now I do. So there's no shame in that at all. Uh, so you can go on Khan Academy and then really impress your kids with the knowledge. But even better, if you're secure enough, tell your kids that you're learning it in parallel with them and model the behavior. Say, I'm going to put in 20 minutes a day as well, make a huge difference. And I, I actually promise you'll actually end up enjoying it. Uh, that's great advice. I personally was embarrassed when asked to help with adding fractions. So um, we have our questions from our audience. Um, you can put them up on Thought Exchange. For all of you, I can read them out and assign them to you. But if you see a question, it will appear on your screen and you want to address it, just feel free to grab it. And uh, you can all answer questions. You can let your friends do it. You know, it's this, this is supposed to be a really interactive part of our conversation with people who are listening. So it looks like they're, the first couple of questions are for OUSD. So please jump in. Kellen and Sandra, can you see the, um, the questions? And I, Lakeisha, I think the first one you're gonna wanna weigh in on as well. How are OUSD teachers incorporating the culturally responsive curriculum in lesson planning to give voice to black and brown students? I can start us off uh, to answer this question. Um, what we have provided is in our curricular choices. So um, we uh, are having to condense down the scope and sequence that our teachers usually use because they don't have the same amount of uh, instructional minutes like they would have in a six hour day. Uh, so because of that, we have been able to refine 
our materials that we are providing our teachers. And what our staff has done is selected, um, you know, articles and passages that reflect our students. Um, so you can um, see that our staff is trying to make sure that we are bringing up relevant uh, and current topics for our students that are um, age appropriate. And we're definitely using the, um, the opportunity right now to bring in uh, more of our social justice stance in our district about being a district that's open for all of the students that we serve. Uh, and the biggest piece is that we're also taking this opportunity to do more um, uh, training for our teachers on how to have these discussions, how to run restorative justice in their um, classrooms and their settings, how to have uh, what we call the morning meeting in the, er in the early years, uh, so really how to create those safe environments even through the virtual setting. Uh, so we really are trying to adjust um, and see this as an opportunity to bring those great resources um, forward. Great, and then um, this might be for you as well, Sandra or Curtis to jump in. Where can people find the 2020-21 OUSD curriculum? And there's a question about uh, what, what are you doing to address concerns that for-profit companies may be getting access to data on our students? And Sal, you might want to jump in on that question as well. Uh, so we do have all of our curriculum uh, posted for our teachers. Um, I would have to uh, circle back and explain how we can get that um, out there for families as well. We do have on Family Central um, the links for the grade level um, content, the goals and the objectives um, by grade level. Uh, so that is already posted on Family Central, the main source that we have provided, um, you know, throughout the session. But I can right, is, back is, that, is that familycentral.org? Because um, we can put that in the chat again. And yes, if any of you have a resource you want our magical interns to pop into the chat, just yell it out and they'll put it in there. Right, so Family Central is our main hub for all of our curriculum, all of our um, guidance guide for families. We do have a lot of support that we're offering families. There's weekly sessions on how to use an aspect of our distance learning programs. Um, so we will, I can circle back and um, make sure that that information is also um, posted. Uh, and just in terms of the, the data um, access, um, I maybe need a little bit more as to like what the person is is trying to get out like we we have to do um data sharing agreements that go through um like all of the legal uh steps to make sure that we're not oversharing information uh there's um, a link through our student information system for the platforms uh, but we don't give um information besides usage i believe to our um to those data companies, if that's well, what Sal, the question is asking. Sal, tell us as parents, what are you doing to make sure that your your organization is not misusing data that you receive through usage? Yeah, no, and first of all, it's a great question. Um, you know, just to take a step back, one of the reasons we set up as a not-for-profit is so that there's not even a temptation to kind of get into some of the behaviors that, once again, not, not all for-profits, but some for-profits uh, do end up doing where data becomes a, a commodity that they, they try to monetize. And so at Khan Academy, just as a principal level, uh, you know, we own, as, and we're not for profit, first of all, but we only use data in service to personalizing for that student or understanding the efficacy of our platform so that we can make it better. Under no circumstances would we ever, you know, monetize that. And that's, you know, in writing in many places. You know, one thing that uh, Sandra brought up is, is districts typically have data sharing agreements with with various uh, platforms, both for-profit and non-profit. We, for example, have a data sharing agreement with uh, Oakland. And, you know, I, I'll just tell you our vantage point because we work with many districts around the country. I think Oakland has a very good <laughs> and reasonable uh, data sharing agreement. Um, so, you know, data is, a, is it's, it's kind of a new frontier and obviously we're all diving into the deep end together uh, because of uh, the crisis. Uh, but, uh, you know, from my vantage point, and, you know, hopefully, you know, people, view me as something of a Switzerland too, because we, we are not for profit. Um, I, 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 if I was a, a parent in, in Oakland Unified, I wouldn't be 
overly concerned. I've been pretty impressed with how the Oakland team has been uh, handling these types of issues. Keisha, I did want you to jump in on that question about curriculum for black and brown students empowerment. Did you have something to add? I know that's something that you are hearing from your parents. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and like you said, the data I showed in my presentation showed that like more than 80% of black and brown families want this. Um, so I will also say that um, right around the corner, like we are um, in conversations with OUSD about that. So what I what I appreciate is that this is a big thing that matters to our families. And it's a conversation that we're having right around the corner with OUSD about it. So all I can say is that it's true. And it's, it's great that we're gonna be able to sort of come to the table and really figure out how we support not just Oakland Reach families, but all Oakland families. One thing I might jump in is, um, is that as far as, um, as, as far as that issue, it's, it's really, it's, it's only the, the delivery of the, the content is only as effective as the people who are actually delivering that. And so I'm talking specifically about our teachers and I have never met a group of, of individuals that's as committed to social justice and for commitment to, um, to making sure that, that students who are, who are underserved um, get the resources that they need. Um, our OUSD teachers and our, our union especially um, is, is very committed to uh, this issue and very committed to social justice. Great, thank you. That has definitely been my experience as well. Curtis, I know that it feels premature to ask any questions about reopening, but this is a great question. Um, what about kids who have relatives at home who are immune compromised? Will there be an option that takes that condition into account once schools open? The person who asked the question has a kidney transplant. Yeah, I mean, even as we were approaching the start of this year, uh, you know, and looking at all of the data and waiting on guidance from the state, and we are looking at hybrid models um, as well as full distance models, you know, we always, um, you know, had looked at having a distance option uh, for situations like this. And so, um, you know, even in a hybrid where some kids could come back in person, if there are circumstances where distance learning were still the best option for a family, uh, that we would provide that option. And so as, you know, as data comes in and as, you know, therapeutics or vaccines and all the things that, you know, are gonna be on the horizon that we'll have to problem solve around uh, come into play, you know, we'll take all that into consideration around how we need to continue to adjust our schooling and our model so that, you know, uh, we keep everyone uh, safe and that we're following the science. Great, thank you for that. There are a couple questions that are probably for me. <laughs> uh, questions about Lake Merritt, it says, when are you gonna close it all together? Uh, what, why is, is an illegal dumping being addressed? It's a health issue. And a question about where are cameras? There are cars with no wheels being dumped in my neighborhood. And I wonder how they are getting there by tow. Um, so a lot of concerns about that. Uh, I urge you to report any blight, illegal dumping, abandoned cars, whatever you need the city to come fix. Uh, you can email 311 at oak, oaklandca.gov. Again, 311 at oaklandca.gov. You can also call the number 311 during business hours. That is your one-stop shop to report problems in the city of Oakland. We also now are have kind of like garbage police, you know, trash police that are out tracking down who is causing this illegal dumping. So it really is important that you report it because we are trying to hold people accountable who are coming into our city and dumping their trash. Also, please encourage your neighbors to move their cars on street sweeping days. In recognition of just the hardships everybody are going through right now, we are not ticketing cars that are there on street sweeping days, but it does keep us from being able to clean the streets. Um, Lake Merritt has been a very sensitive issue. We are trying very hard to balance health uh, directives, but with the fact that people are trying to be outdoors, uh, which also is 
encouraged both for your mental health as well as uh, for COVID. There is less risk risk of infection outdoors. Uh, we have done some traffic calming that last weekend had a very positive effect in reducing some of the crowds. But I encourage you, if you are seeing violations of the noise ordinance or something like that, you can call in. Again, 311 is a non-police number if that is your preference, or of course, uh, 911 for the police. But we are trying to balance um, people's need to be outdoors uh, and some of our local merchants' desires to uh, continue to have some income during this this COVID crisis. Please keep your suggestions going. Uh, it is probably not possible to shut down Lake Merritt. Um, that, that is not something that would be legal at this time. So we, we are trying our best to minimize the crowds. Um, all right, if you can scroll the questions, I'd love to see. Um, uh, there's a question about the number of minutes of instruction uh, in Oakland Unified compared to other districts. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, I would uh, start off by saying that we do um, negotiate those items um, with our labor partner and um, ours is the Oakland Education uh, Association. It's often uh, referred to as OEA. Uh, so we do have to come to an agreement on uh, those minutes. Of course, the state sets the minimum number of minutes, period, but they did not specify these. Um, this amount should be live, this amount should be uh, done independently. And so um, we did receive a range of feedback from our families that stated it's too much time, it's not enough time. So we did try to, um, you know, kind of get this medium spot uh, to address both of the the different um, views on uh, the number of live minutes. While we were negotiating, we were also um, being mindful of our surrounding uh, districts. So we did check, uh, you know, with the other districts and, um, you know, to see how many uh, live minutes that they were negotiating, but we were all in negotiations at the same time. Uh, so we did really attempt to be, um, you know, comparable to, um, San Francisco, uh, West Contra Costa, uh, you know, San Diego kind of came out um, in the beginning with their MRU because they had reached agreement earlier than we did. Uh, so we did really try to be mindful of that. But in the end, it is an agreement between um, our district and our teachers union on how many live minutes we're able to offer. Great. No, thank you. The next question is one that I'm thinking that Sal and Lakeisha and Kellen all might want to weigh in on. And it has to do with um, particularly our special needs kids that um, where Zoom may not be working for them. It says Zoom is very unconnected for some children. It says, recognizes teachers are doing a wonderful job. Um, but but it is not necessarily working well for other everyone. And so what are we learning about how to make Zoom or distance learning effective for special needs kids? How are we making sure that it is not further stratifying, stratifying our children in their education? Lakeisha, I know this is something that is really at the heart of what you've been doing. So what are the tips for special needs kids and how do we um, prevent further stratification? I mean, we did over the hub serve um, students that had special needs. Um, I think prior to the hub, we really tried to understand sort of what our families, um, we actually have a disproportionate amount of families with special needs um, um, within the Oakland reach. I think a lot of that in the summer was the families and the teachers, right, that taught um, and the family liaisons actually working closely together to make sure students do the kind of supports that they need the families being there. Um, and again, it, it's an ongoing challenge um, because it just is. But I think the ways in which we try to really um, support is making sure that they're, you know, the, the more that the family and the more that the parent is involved and really seen as the leader, it really helps to create a, um, a great path of communication around meeting the needs of students um, in this environment on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we thought would really work in all scenarios. Great, any other um, recommendations for special needs kids? 
I think that one of the things that we've really identified is is that uh, for special needs kids, it's really important to have small group or one-on-one -on -one instruction um, using Zoom. Um, it's it's really I, I really relate to the to the statement or the question that was that was proposed because I I can see my kids um, just kind of zoning out. It's not the same as being there. Um, kids they need that they need the the, the full sensory experience of being in the classroom. Um, so it's just not going to replicate it. It's not going to be the same no matter what, but definitely um, making sure that we identify those students that have special needs and need more attention and making sure that they get more personalized attention is super important. All right, well, uh, then there's a question about funds donated to OUSD for tech equipment and tech support and maintenance on site. So I don't know if Curtis has any updates as far as funding for on-site technology and tech support. Uh, I will say we are all looking forward to a day where we don't have to have bake sales to support public education. And I will make a shameless plug to vote for Proposition 15. That is the schools and communities first um, initiative. I think I'm, it's after hours. I'm on a personal computer, so I can say I urge you all to consider voting for Proposition 15 that would radically improve funding for public education uh, throughout the state of California. But in the meantime, Curtis, are there updates on uh, resources to help school sites improve technology? I mean, I, I would actually just turn over you to Kellis or Sandra to talk about the, the distance learning leads and the way that we're actually supporting um, some of those uh, items that this questioner asked here, because we, we do have designated learning leads at each site. Kellis or Sandra, would, would one of you want to take that? Sure, I can, I can start by um, speaking to that. So the distance learning leads, they are identified at each site. It might be one more than one person. Uh, who is a teacher or staff member at that site who's really taking the, the lead uh, to to make sure that uh, well there are a lot of a lot of various roles involved with that but um, making sure that students have the technology that they need um, that they not only have devices uh, computers uh, Chromebooks but they also have internet connection um, and also making sure that the teachers have what they need um, if they need support, as far as um, as far as just training or or um, the programs that we're using, just making sure that um, that at the site that the needs are met. I would definitely like to add something to this, um, Mayor Schaff. Um, one of the key components of the hub was we hired our own tech support, and the reason why I really want to be bring this up as important is because when our parents are not able to help their kids access technology, so we can put the computers, we can put the infrastructure, but when that support's not there and around the clock, we are literally talking about the difference between a kid accessing a class and not accessing a class, right? Um, for that given hour or even that given day. So not sure what's happening um, on the district end, but we knew for the hub, it was really critical to have dedicated tech support um, and tech support that was like local um, that really was connected to our communities and understood how to work with our families. So I just want to, I want to really note that beefing up now that there's going to be all of these Chromebooks out in circulation, making sure that families are able to get tech support and helping them understand how quickly they should expect tech support. Cause if they're reaching out to you, there's probably a child that's not getting in, um, a class or getting that, you know, getting that learning. I really appreciate that. That comment, Lakeisha is so true. Um, because we can get Chromebooks out to everybody, but they're basically their doorstops if they're they're not internet connected and if they don't have the support, uh, if families don't and students don't have the support that they need. So I would really um, just just lifting up the Family Central website one more time uh, because there there are resources and there also is there's a phone number where we're tech uh, we're partnering with Tech Exchange also. Tech Exchange um, has a hotline so that families can call and there is multilingual support also. So that phone number is on Family Central. Um, I just saw that Antoine put that in the chat. Thank you for, for putting that in there. So that uh, is an excellent resource uh, for exactly the, the kind of things that, that Lakeisha was talking about. 
Okay. Well, thank you all. We are coming to the end of our time. I'm going to invite each one of you to give some brief closing remarks. But while you do, I would ask um, our interns to put into the chat the phone number and uh, email address and website or for uh, the Family Hubs and Oakland Reach. Uh, again, if you are looking to volunteer to help a student that might need some extra support, um, here's a place you can do it. Also, please put into the chat the email for the Oakland Public Education Fund, which runs the school district's volunteer program. Believe it or not, a job I used to have a long time ago. Uh, so that those are ways we can all get involved and also shout out to Tech Exchange, the nonprofit that has been in Oakland for more than a quarter of a century. They are providing student-based technology support in the homes as part of the Oakland Undivided Partnership. So Tech Exchange, a wonderful nonprofit here in Oakland that is gonna really be providing kind of culturally competent community-based tech support for all of those families that are getting those laptops and, and hotspots. So um, Sal, we started with you. Please just give us some quick closing thoughts as we get ready to sign off tonight. Yeah, you know, it's definitely a suboptimal time. It's a hard time, but there are some opportunity silver linings here. Uh, I think as a family, you know, this is a chance to really get engaged. The tools are all there. We already talked a lot about Khan Academy. There's actually another project. It's a very early stage project. It's outside of Khan Academy. I want to let folks know and be the first if you want to get in on it. Uh, we heard from the survey with, the, with families that they really want one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, there's a project that I started with volunteers called schoolhouse.world uh, where folks can actually sign up for free group tutoring sessions uh, through vetted high quality volunteer tutors. Some of our tutors are like professors at Oxford. So you can imagine it's really fun and you might, and your child might be in a class with, we had some children from Ghana showed up. I just ran a class with some kids from Pakistan. So it's a really fun thing to stay connected to the world and start learning uh, some academic standards, get a little bit more help. Uh, we're starting in high school math, but you should sign up regardless of where your child is. And across subjects, we're going to be adding SAT soon. We're going to be adding many, many other subjects. So uh, definitely check out Khan Academy. Definitely check out schoolhouse.world. And uh, don't, don't stress more than you need to. Schoolhouse.world. All right, put that in the chat. Thank you, Sal. It's just been an honor to have you with us tonight. Lakeisha, please, your closing thought. Closing thoughts is just one thank you for having us. Um, and really, you know, we have solutions. Like we really have thought about solutions to serve our community. And, you know, we're starting to see some emails come in. Thank you from Hub at Hub at Oakland Reach. So whether you need the support or really want to step in to provide support to families um, during this time, because like I said, the, the energy and love around community is, 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 is nothing like I've seen before. So um, email us at Hub at Oakland Reach and, and come join the movement. Thank you so much, Sandra. Sandra and Kellen. Uh, I'll start off and hand it over to Kellen. I just uh, want to thank uh, everyone for showing up this evening and having this conversation. It really is through these forums that we're able to make the improvements that our families, you know, both want and need. Um, I also just want to thank our philanthropy and all the organizations that have been reaching out to us to help us. It really does uh, make a huge difference. I remember. And I think I shared with uh, Mayor Schaaf that when we did get the donation for technology, it was like this huge weight uh, was lifted off of us because we had the financial means to provide access uh, for our students uh, to our instruction. And now it's just a matter of getting those into our family's hands and making sure that they know how to use them. But just a really huge thank you for the outpouring of uh, support that we have received in our district and throughout the city. Kellef and Curtis. Thank you, Sandra. I just wanted to um, want to say thank you for, to uh, to being uh, for being part of this amazing panel. I also just want to give a real big shout out to the families. The families are essential partners right now. Um, you've had to step up and you've had to take an active part in education. It's not just dropping off your kids at at school and and letting it all hang open. You are part of your child's education and learning and you've been asked to do more than you ever have. So we really appreciate you and really recognize that. Lots of respect for you, thank you. Curtis. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, honored to be here with, with everybody and most importantly honored to uh, 
have an opportunity to really talk directly with our families and community. Uh, and just to reiterate what I started is that we really were listening. Uh, we need to hear. Uh, the only way to get better um, collectively is to continue to listen, uh, take solutions like Lakeisha and her group have um, taken, look at ways to scale those types of ideas. And just, um, you know, big kudos to the whole city. I've been hearing from so many partners from within the city to community-based organizations, grass roots from Oakland Housing Authority that are all really, we're all looking at ways to continue to expand and find creative, innovative solutions to give kids the social, emotional, and academic supports that they need um, to, uh, to, as Lakeisha said, thrive during this most challenging time and not just survive. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. In this moment, we're showing our kids that we are all learners <laughs> in this moment, that education matters for your entire life. So again, hope to see you all two weeks from today, September 17th, 6 o'clock, with the Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. We're going to talk about how to get your vote on this year, more important than ever. Thank you, and good night, Oakland.